Hi, everyone. I'm Josh Plassey. Uh, I'm an actor and a filmmaker. Some things you might know for you know me for recently, I should say. Uh, I'm going to go with the film The Resurrection of Charles Manson, which is my most recent piece that I just made with uh, my filmmaking team. Uh, another beautiful film called Wildflower. Uh, a lot of you probably still know me from Grey's Anatomy or perhaps American Horror Story. And lastly, I'd say The Baxters, which is a show that has not actually aired yet, but has such a huge audience that uh, it kind of got me some traction early on and um, has had a lot of you all engage with me on social media. So I appreciate that. Josh Plassey, welcome to the Make It Podcast. Thanks, Chris. Anytime, anytime. And it's always an honor to have someone who not just became and is becoming ever more successful organically the way you did, but someone as competitive and, and hard working as you, I am similar. And I think that, that, uh, we, we will have a lot in common and it came from probably similar backgrounds to get into film. So I can relate to your journey quite a bit. I think you did a great job introducing yourself, but to give this audience a deeper sense of who you are and your accomplishments. I'm going to read from a short bio. <laughs> and like I always say, this is the internet. So if anything is incorrect or needs to be amended to, just let me know at the end. All right. You got it. Josh Plassey is an actor, boxer, writer, and producer born in Virginia. He attended Virginia Commonwealth University, uh, known as VCU, from 2011 to 2013 and was privately, privately coached by Joseph Obermuller who's an MFA director at the theater and associate professor of theater. He moved from Virginia to Hollywood with only five months of acting experience to expand his acting career. In 2018, he guest starred on as Chris Cleaver on long running hit ABC drama, Grey's Anatomy. I think we all know that one. He was later cast as Wes on iCarly, which was an exciting experience for him being that it was his favorite show growing up. In June 2021, Josh produced his company's first feature film titled Yucca Valley. In addition to his notable work mentioned above, Plassey has also been seen in Notorious, The Baxters, Grownish, Criminal Minds, Happily Ever After, There's No Such Thing as Vampires, Murder in the Vineyard, and All Out Dysfunction. He will be seen in the faith-based series The Baxters based off the best-selling novels by Karen Kingsbury. His film work showcase, I'm sorry, his film work will showcase him both on screen and off screen this year uh, in the TIFF favorite Wildflower, which uh, also here is awesome, starring opposite Kieran and Shipka. That's from uh, Mad Men fame, right? Oh, yeah. She was in, yes, she was wonderful in that. Brad Great. Garrett, Gene Smart, and Charlie Plummer. The film will release on Hulu or did release on Hulu on March 17th. He can also be seen in The Resurrection of Charles Manson opposite Frank Grillo and Jamie King. Is it Grillo or Grillo? I think Grillo. I think you're spot on. Yeah, I've heard Frank Grillo. Guys, but they say Grillo, so I'm going with them themselves. <laughs> Perfect. Frank Grillo and Jamie King this spring. And he recently wrapped production on his film Ride, starring, starring Annabeth Gish. He wrote and produced the film, as well as starred as the male lead. What a background. And I'd love to start. We're going to kind of jump all over the place as we do on the Make like It podcast, but like I'd love to start it, uh, with a story about the time you lost 19 pounds on your pilgrimage to LA. Wow, man. You know, as you, I would love to start there. I would also like to add that as you went through that, I, you know me better than me. I was like, man, I should have said all this. <laughs> I was like, I Carly was probably my favorite one. That's probably what I'm known for the most. I was like, man, I left that one out. Oh, that was a great point. Oh, man. <laughs> Spot on. I would love to talk about that. Yes. Where shall we begin? Uh, maybe we start in Virginia and your and your decision to to go to L.A. and um, the adventure that it was. Oh, my gosh, man. Um, well, to get to the 19 pounds, I'll, I'll kind of start a little, <laughs> a little bit uh, further down the line. But yes, yes. So I was at VCU, as you already said, and uh, Joseph Obermuller was coaching me. He is the absolute man. Shout out to Joe. Honestly, changed my life forever in a multitude of ways. But um, the short gist is that I was actually training really hard at the time. My father was a Navy SEAL, so I was actually trying to go down that path myself. I was in uh, Homeland Security and criminal justice and a uh, very, very competitive guy, like you were saying earlier, running, shooting, swimming, all that good stuff. 
And I was just way too serious in my life. So uh, I had a good buddy named Adam Valentine who was doing theater at the time with Joe. And they were like, man, you should come in here and just have some fun, you know, take a load off. So I did and extremely long <laughs> short, fell in love with it. And Joe, you know, got me to do all these silly things. Like, I mean, man, it was hilarious. Just embarrassing me every day to get me out of my shell. And finally, I went to this Pizza Hut commercial. And it was maybe my, my second or third audition ever, right? And it's in Virginia where there's not that much going on. Even today, there's not that much film going on. And I made it all the way to, at the time, uh, I believe it was like the fourth producer callback. The director was there. It was pretty far and I had no experience. I was just getting there on a wing and a prayer, like literally just getting there off of dumb luck because I, I knew so little that they were like, man, this kid's good. He doesn't care at all. <laughs> and I was just like, no, I'm not <laughs> and uh, anyways, got to the final bit with the director where he exposed how bad I truly was at the time. So uh, I didn't get the part. Went back to Joe, but I had the fire then, you know, I was like, oh man, now I, now I, I see this. I want this, this, and, and, and the fire grew and yeah, yeah, yeah. he and I had a big conversation, which we'll get to later. He suggested I go to LA. I went out like two months later and, um, on the drive there, we, <laughs> I don't know for sure what it was, but I'm going to attribute the 19 pounds to some food I had in Texas. <laughs> I love Texas, but <laughs> it was rough. Soon as I got to LA, the first day I was in the ICU for three nights, literally lost oh 19 God. pounds. I had, it was, it was horrible. Yeah, it was really, really bad. What city in Texas do we need to avoid? And what did you, and what did you order? What did you order? Okay. So here's the thing. Definitely don't avoid it because it was Amarillo and I actually mm -hmm. love Amarillo. I, I have a sidebar. I have driven cross country 14 times because I have a wow. Siberian Husky. Yes. And to go from California to the East Coast all the time, I can't fly with him. So I have to drive. And every single time, generally speaking, if you take the I-40, the map will stop you through Amarillo. So I've stopped mm -hmm. there every time, never had any trouble. The first time I ever went, I had some smoked meat at a very suspicious place off the highway. <laughs> I was not sure. It was, uh, there was nothing good about it. And, uh, you know, no one else got sick. So, hey, maybe I just have weak genes or something. But it was it was unpleasant. Yeah, it's weird how it works, because the second you know you have food poisoning, you're waiting to find out everyone else. Like you're, you're saying, OK, everyone else is about to get sick, too. And then when they don't. It freaks you out a little bit. You're like, wait a second. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everybody, everybody ate what I ate. It is just me. Like, how am I the only one in the ICU? So, no, I, I, it's crazy. And I've never really had, I can't be sure that it was food poisoning, but I had PF Chang's one time and I got this like sauce with the lettuce wraps. Oh, okay. And I had a pain in my pancreas, unlike anything I've ever experienced. I was on my knees. Oh. I was two minutes from calling an ambulance. Like, I couldn't believe it. And I wow. consider myself a tough person. Yeah. yeah. And it, it went away. I got in the shower. It hurt so bad. So, and sat down. Yeah. It went away and it never has come back. It's like the most mysterious thing where it's like food poisoning normally lasts a while. Yeah. And like yeah. you're, you're throwing up. You, I didn't have any of that. I just had just like put a knife right in my stomach and just keep oh. turning it and turning oh. it for about five minutes and for five minutes. And then it went away. So strange. And it's never come back. Even when I've had that sauce again, although I've stayed pretty much away from it because I think, I, you know, I blame it, but I don't even know if that was really it. So that's the, it, it, it's, Not it's fun. weird. And I, yeah. I, I will tell you, you're a, a brave soul and, and it does speak again to your competitiveness and your toughness to have made so many cross country trips. And I say that from experience. I rode a, a Greyhound bus from Nashville to Northern California, Cloverdale, California, when I was nice. 17. Uh, my mother was afraid of flying, so we would always drive everywhere we went. Every vacation we had, we drove. I love that. Uh, so oh, California, man. Vegas, New York, Joe DC, Vegas. wherever we went, we were driving. And I didn't realize people hated it. Yeah. I thought everybody just, of course, you'd want to pile up in the car and like drive. And and everyone I'm around is like, are you kidding me? Yeah, yeah. Let's same. let's get on a flight and get there in an hour. What are you talking yeah. about? <laughs> Not me. Like Not even me in all. Florida, I drive to Florida. People hate like they're like no. Same. And now there's all these articles about increased turbulence coming up in the next ten years. Keep me out. I'm 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 good. 
I'm good. I'll take the wheel. What do you what, what do you mean? To, what is what is happening with the turbulence? Oh man, if you haven't seen this, check it out. They they drop this not. article. It's probably been five or six articles in maybe the last week, and essentially they're just talking about climate change impacting jet streams and mm -hmm. the validity of that. I'm not sure, but I do know for a fact that evidently over the next ten years, what's called clear air turbulence is going to increase tenfold which is crazy. Wow. And it's, it's essentially like they're saying that I'm not, I'm not a scientist or, or a mathematician on the material, but the gist from the articles is that it's a lot tougher for pilots to see the clear air turbulence and stuff that's going on with like a mixture of smog and the current climate issues is making it really tough, particularly in area. There's a few areas they, they named like Tampa, a lot of places in Europe. Um, and for some reason, whatever it is over those pockets of air, People have been getting hurt really bad. Like Matthew McConaughey got hospitalized. I don't know if you saw that the other month. I did not. Yeah, he had a seatbelt out. Just boom. Like when the plane drops, you smack your head. And they're saying there's been like 143 hospitalizations from turbulence alone, which is super wow. strange. I know. Complete yeah, sidebar really strange. podcast, but very weird. Well, we do tangents here. And, you know, I have a couple of, of <laughs> long, very long flights coming up. So this was <laughs> apropos to, to yeah. my actual life. And I, I wanted to know because... I saw the story, uh, what was it, last week about Chaos GPT, these oh, guys who wow. created Chaos GPT. And they're, it sounds like a prank, but their, their stated goal is to, is to like sort of unwind humanity <laughs> through AI. And they talk about doing things like hacking into airplanes and just making it crash. Wow. And, and I'm like, we're in that era now. We're in I'll, 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 I'll stay in my car. You know, you've got the, you've got the Alaskan Husky. I got my golden doodles. We'll pile them up in the car. And we'll, we'll drive where we need to go. I, I'm you know, man, I'm with you. I, I agree. I, I actually don't know anything about the chaos Chad GPT yet, but, uh, but man, that's yeah. Google that. Dude, that's, get me off. Google chaos GPT. Like we, who are these people that hate themselves? I know. I know. And, they, and so they want to, they want to mess with everybody. Like, I, I don't understand. Like, like love your life, man. Love other people. I, I don't get it. Any, anyway, back on topic. You mentioned your dad was a Navy SEAL. That's that's incredible. And I've kind of had that military background a little bit as well, right. but a generation removed. Um, my grandfather was a merchant Marine and then awesome. joined the U.S. Army. And you know, it's funny because back then you would sneak off. You would run away from home to join the military. And now you pretty much have to be recruited and have no options, it feels like, for some yeah. people. <laughs> Very it's just a weird, it's a weird change of, of sort of prestige. But yeah, um, and my dad went to 16 schools in 12 years, you know, Army brat. And yeah. um, my grandfather would always tell him even though he was in it for 20 years, retired from the military, he would always tell him don't never join the military. Wow. And I, I thought about that when I was researching you and your dad and mm -hmm. your background. I'm just wondering what was your father's honest reaction to you making this shift from, you know, going through home, you know, trying to go this Homeland security path to acting. Yeah, it's a great question. No, uh, very great question. And interesting because his father before him was actually CIA. And okay. so there, you know, it's a long lineage of, I guess, bad dudes. <laughs> then comes me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, man, you know, I, ha I had and I think have most of the, the tools and skills necessary at the time. And his, his, you know, when I told him, it's a very long story short, that same coach I was telling you about, Joseph Oakmuller, um, mm -hmm. we had to sit down one day. We were talking, having a very serious discussion because I, you know, I was ready. My metaphorical bags were packed to go to Bud's, do the whole thing, do the dance. And, and, you know, you talked a little bit about the military being different these days, about life being different and stuff like that. And ultimately my goal is to just make a positive influence in the world. Like that's it. And, um, at the time, and this is, this is just me, we had a conversation and he said, listen, man, to me, Washington is power, but Hollywood is influence. And Washington mm -hmm. being metaphorical about everything, you know, politics, military, all the above. Um, and so he was like, you know, there might be a time where your specific skill set lends itself a little bit better to trying to make a, a different type of change, a more marketable change, if you will. And one is not more valuable than the other. Anyone who puts their life on the line for this country is, I have, I 
can't even begin to express the level of gratitude. Um, but there is a competitive argument that I believed at the time and still do that, hey, you know, we're in the age right now of technology where, hey, you know, dad, I think there might be a world where I can put some stuff out into the world that might shift the culture a little bit. And so my dad actually took it pretty well. You know, he, he laughed at first, <laughs> gave me a hard time, uh, but ultimately you know, he took it really well. He, he's a great, he's a great father. And, um, you know, we had really good discussions on it and he firmly believes in the cause, believes in it all. And, uh, has honestly supported me the entire time. I'm glad to hear it wasn't like a Zoolander moment. <laughs> oh, man. It was it was far from that. It was far from that. Yeah, we do that. Merman dad. Yeah. Yeah. Hilarious. Merman. Yeah, that's good. That's good. And I do find that being a common theme, you know, in these conversations is that when you have your parents support early, you can go a lot further. You need people to naysay you, but they don't need to be your parents. Yeah, I agree. I definitely Right. That the, the people who don't think you can do it, they keep you competitive and driven, but you need your parents to buy you that first camera or drive you to that first audition or support a decision that isn't going to be popular. And so, you know, kudos to Roger. Yeah, <laughs> he'll, watch this. he'll watch this. I love it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, I think it's, I think it's incredible. And I, I, we have this other thing in common where, you know, for me, I was I grew up playing football and basketball. And when I always tell people, no one stops playing those sports, you, right. you are forced to stop playing. Yeah. And that's when I went to piano and piano led to storytelling and arts. It was the other thing I was good at. My whole life growing up, Josh, it was just the other thing I was good at. Right, right. The right. main thing I was good at was sports. Right. And so I'm curious, why did football stop for you? Because you were a star football player in your high school. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you. I, uh, You know, it's interesting. Well, the short answer is, A, I played quarterback, and I'm only about 5'10". So at 5'10", unless you're Drew Brees, the dream dies pretty quick <laughs> once you get to the D1 NFL level. Um, but no, I mean, we I loved football. Um, we, we actually ran a triple option offense. And so back in the day, it was that Georgia Tech style thing where the quarterback ran a lot. Oh, crap. Of yeah, yeah. yeah. So I did actually have a few places I could go to play, but they were not, you know, it was not D1 caliber. We're talking D3. I think there was like one D2 place that I was like, okay, probably yeah. go here. Good educational schools. Washington and Lee was actually one of them. And so there's some really, really great schools where I, I could have gone, could have played football potentially, but that just wasn't where I felt I was being called at the time. And I really hadn't given it, you know, to be at that competitive level in football. I mean, it's got to be your life. And, yeah. you know, and candidly, I was very, I was good, but at the time, I mean, I was, I was still boxing at the time. I was playing other sports. I was doing a lot of things and it, it just wasn't my, this is it for me. So I did have an option to continue, but I think, and I'm glad I didn't, the, the writing on the wall was that, you know, at best you get a, you know, you get maybe a scholarship of some caliber, you get free college and you keep playing, but then the time that you're going to be dedicating to that what could that time be doing elsewise? And for me, yeah, intentions being in the teams at the time, I just didn't really see how that how that was going to help me. So that's really the, the short answer to it. What was your forty time? <laughs> it wasn't bad and it wasn't great. I'm trying to remember. I think I was like a for. I mean, they got you in the triple option, Josh. I know. <laughs> I was, I was <laughs> crash, I, I, to be completely honest, I don't. I think four or five. Uh, four, four. Oh, that's fast, bro. It that's was, fast. It was. I, I was. You, you can. You can roll. I can roll. I can roll. I'm very explosive. I'm not fast. You know, put me. Put me in the ten yard. We'll, we'll rock and roll. <laughs> but the forty time, I'm not yeah. as fast. I was a four seven guy. That's great. And I think I probably could have ran a four six in my twenties, yes. but there was no yeah. official time clock. So you, you can, you can roll, dude. And uh, that's. <laughs> No, 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 no question about it. Now I have to, I feel like I should ask you what your all time bench, one, one rep bench was as well. <laughs> it actually wasn't <laughs> that great. Oh man. I think the most I ever did was like 275, 270. Um, so for football, legit, legit for a quarterback. Yeah. Yeah. Legit yeah, yeah for a quarterback. For mo I mean, there were guys in high school who were repping 275 for freaking 10 reps. And I'm just sitting there. Like, yeah. He's How? I still, I still am like, brownies. yeah, I know, I know. I was like, 
couldn't do that today. No way. Um, yeah, I'm still like, how? Yeah, it's crazy. It's, it's crazy. Freak genetics yeah. and a lot of hard work. Yeah. Yeah, it's like your bone structure is just wider yeah. when you can lift that much. Like you're just a, a giant human being. It's and so, yeah, when I was young coming up, somebody told me fat is power. <laughs> <laughs> Power, the, power. I love that. Yeah. So if you get a big old boy in there and just have him start lifting, he's going to be doing 350. He's going to be doing his weight in no time. It's true. It's true. And the same goes for combat sports. I find the guys who come in way heavier. I don't know. Maybe this sounds mean, but like having carried all of that weight for a long time, once they cut down, you get your, yep. Roy, you know, your Roy Nelson juniors or Daniel Corman and they start cutting down. It's like, these guys are just mm -hmm. big beasts, dude. Um, my, I, I'm not good at raw power. I'll tell you, like my 275 bench is not impressive. However, at the same time, I was power cleaning dang near that. So I'm much more wow. explosive. Like I'm an explosive lifter. I did a lot of Olympic lifting. I competed in CrossFit for a while afterwards. Like I'm really good with that stuff, fast switch muscle fibers, but you put me on a one rep squat or a one rep bench and like, I'm going to get tossed around. It's not, I'm not impressive. Yeah, and Daniel Cormier, for those wondering, is a legendary MMA fighter. And uh, somehow, somehow underrated. Somehow, in my underrated. mind, just but be, just because you know he doesn't get the headlines the way that some of the more gregarious and charismatic MMA fighters, you know, sort of. And, and, and he doesn't win in a way the way that like John Jones wins. Yes, and doesn't have headlines. So you know, there are going to be people who just don't know who it is. So I just thought I'd clue the audience in on Daniel Cormier, who is Thank you. awesome, awesome, yeah. awesome. Yep. Legend. Yes. Ag agreed. Your first gig, yep. you made it out to LA, your first gig on criminal minds, <laughs> they kill, they kill you, they kill you off. Oh yeah. Quickly. But my guess, just knowing your personality from living in the world of, of Josh Plassey for the last week is that you overprepared for these three lines in this dying scene. So oh, yeah. how did you rehearse dying in your first gig <laughs> and did they let did they let you improvise at all how you died oh that's hilarious you know what's so funny is uh so yes i did come way over prepared at the time i had like, <laughs> auditions i had a 12 hour rule where there's a 12 hour minimum even if it's one line and it was complete overkill and i i ultimately walked away from yeah. that structure but i'm glad i did it and i you know for those three lines i had three different ways that i was ready to say them all which inherently was not good. I was just beginning. Like in, in true acting, you should just be present in the moment. You should not come predetermined and predisposed on how you're going to say something. Because if you, as Chris, say it differently to me, then all of a sudden I respond in a way that's already been dictated. It doesn't make any sense. Um, so, you know, I was learning. That's really good. Yeah, yeah it's really very, very interesting. Um, acting is a, a man at the highest level. It's an incredible craft. It really is. What, what, you're, what you're getting at there, not to interject, uh, yeah. too long what you're getting at there is that as an actor you have to be listening right 100 percent, always so if you come predetermined how you're going to say it yep. it's gone then you didn't you're not going to listen exactly you're not the, listen. yeah okay. you sorry go ahead that? no no i'm glad you, you said that yeah you will sometimes i talk and i just uh, i i i imagine that everyone has been studying acting their whole life <laughs> and then it's like <laughs> dude, slow down but yes, exactly. It's like, man, if you're if you come with with indication or you say what you're going to say beforehand and you, you've got these lines in this specific manner, number one, the director will probably have a hard time giving you direction because if you're already if you're so internalized on how you're going to deliver this and he says, hey, that's not working. Try it this way. You'd be surprised how your body's like, oh, gosh, I've prepared it this way. So yeah. I prepared it three different ways. And then we got there on the day. And again, it was an incredibly small part, so it was pretty easy. But um, it was, you know, none of the ways that I delivered it were how it should have been told. <laughs> and thankfully, I had a little bit of, um, you know, I, I was ready. I had prepared so long that I was ready for anything that was thrown at me. And I did prepare how to die. I had practiced that. I had rehearsed that looking like an idiot for <laughs> hours on end just in my room. Like, oh, like, being stupid. <laughs> And ultimately, they just cut to my character dead. So I didn't even get uh, <laughs> And he didn't even ask me to try. He was like, oh, don't worry about it, dude. We're going to cut to you dead. And just walked off. And like, so it was <laughs> and just hours of grueling, you know, stage play on how to die. And he's just like, no, I'm going to cut to you. Don't worry about it. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. I assume it was a, a gunshot. No, 
death, like a gun of gun violence death. Gun violence. So because I, I, so you were you were practicing sort of getting blown away and then having to. And it do, turns do you out an actor tied at the table like this, and they come in, oh. and the camera, you know, slowly pans, catches you, guy's dead. That's all. Um, I mean, I was in and out of there in eight hours. Um, so yes, that's pretty. That's yeah, easy, easy money right there. But but you maybe not because it was your first gig. It's your first gig. You really over prepared, yes. came ready, had all your. So you put in the work. You earned every bit of that. As an actor, do you find, do you get annoyed um, watching how some actors make choices around how to die? And and if so, like what like what's for the actors out there listening to this? Okay. What what which style of dying should they avoid? Like, like <laughs> if, if if you know what I'm saying, like yeah. is there a, is there a face that you've just seen producers or directors hate? that you make or sounds that you make when you die that they just were like, no, we're not dying like that. Yes. Oh, for sure. I would just keep it really simple and say less is more like in real life. If you get shot, I mean, obviously there are so many different scenarios, but you're going down. I mean, it's usually, it's probably mm -hmm. lights out. And so not that I'm sitting around death all the time, but like you see these films and people get shot, they're throwing their hands in the air and screaming. And it's like, you're, you're not even going to be able to, <laughs> like, like they'll get shot yeah. in your leg and be like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. what are you doing? <laughs> uh, just less is more. Let's just say that, man. Less is more. Let them do it. And Very it's incredible good. what, like you said earlier, it's incredible what can be cut around, you know, it's like, yeah. okay, just even if the death is just horrific, if you do a terrible job, they'll just pan to you on the ground later. It's okay. Um, so I would just say less. Yeah, the cutaway to death does work, I think, in, in, in general. The one thing that – it's not the one thing, but one of the things that irritates me is when someone – and I guess this does kind of go back to just sports and being having to deal with injury. If someone is shot, right above the knee and I see them walking two scenes later. <laughs> I'm just like, come on, dude, come on. Like, yes. like, let me just tell you, if you just sprain your knee, you're not walking that day. No. Easy. Yeah. You're, you're, you're laboring. You're laboring. Like you tear your you slightly tear your MCL, you're laboring. So if you get shot in it, the movie's over. <laughs> this, 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 <laughs> I agree, man. I completely agree. The only people, and it's funny because I've actually been studying them a lot, and I, I, I'm I'm blown away. I, there's a couple of guys. I think Darren Prescott, like Aaron Cohen, is another guy um, who are essentially stunt coordinators, directors. They do all kinds of stuff, multifaceted filmmakers at the highest level. But they're mm -hmm. the guys who work with John Wick. And John Wick, even though that's still, of course, a bit ridiculous and, and may, one could argue the most ridiculous, it's also pretty awesome in a way, in the ways that they like, they're doing some pretty real judo when he's hip to awesome people over tables and doing cool stuff. And like Keanu's legit, like he's, a, he's, a, he's yeah. actually a legit martial artist. He really goes out. I think he did like eight months of firearms training with Terran Tactical. Like he, these guys are cool. And so that kind of thing, I, I you know, Obviously, you need a budget for that. It's tough. You can't hire some actor off the street and say, hey, go study. <laughs> go Keeping Seagal is probably available. Right, right, right. <laughs> it's like, oh, it's tough. But they, they did it well, even though it's, it's crazy. Like when you see a lot of those people die, it's pretty believable. Yeah. It, it's, it, to be in a, even if the movie is over the top like John Wick or, or that series is, to be believable, people do have to die on the screen in a non-corny way. It's, it's like um, Tom Cruise and Will Smith mm. when they're in movies, they, they have scenes where they run full speed Yeah, and it looks real because they know how to run Yes, and it sounds weird to say, but there's a lot of people that are actors that have never had to run full speed. Like they don't know how to run. They, like you, for example, at yeah. four or five speed, you need like a Cruise Will Smith role where you can run full speed. I would love that. It's coming. Yeah. And cause it would look so authentic it would, fun. it would look real and that's what people want you just you just again going back to the audience being you know uh, this in our pre-chat before we started recording like yeah. the audience is smart like they know when something's authentic or not yes 
yeah, yeah. Um, you watch a football movie, you know that person's never thrown a football in their life. <laughs> Basketball oh. movie, you can tell they've never shot yeah. a shot. Like there's this some, is brutal. There's some brutal in that. Yeah, yeah. So the best ones are 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 the ones where it's 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 super authentic and it requires an incredible commitment, you know, on the part of the actor. Yeah, yeah, I agree. We talked a, a little bit about auditioning and getting your first gig. Yeah. You are a big fan of the book, the, the Wallace Aud uh, audition technique. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So W A L L A C E for those looking to go on Amazon and pick it up. Yeah. Uh, but what did it teach you about auditioning and, and how were your auditions improved after reading it? Yeah. Great question. Wow. Um, so the Wallace audition technique is written by a guy named Craig Wallace, who was the first person I ever met in Los Angeles, not just in acting, but just period. I had read that book in Virginia. Uh, I had reread it on the flight. As soon as I landed in LA, well, first I went to the hospital for three days. Then after that, yeah. <laughs> once I got better, I went. Sur survived the smoked meat. Survived the smoked meat. Then I went and met Craig. And um, so he's a, he's an acting coach and a teacher. He does actually a lot more than that. He does many things for studio systems, et cetera. But um, in the book, he, he details a lot of things. And one is kind of what we talked about earlier, about just actively listening and, um, you know, there's a couple of studios that I've seen do this, but like they'll, they'll take a pillow, for example, you can hold the pillow in your hand for me. And if I'm saying something to you, I'll throw the pillow, and then you have to catch it with my line and the intention and idea just being, it's a very simple, silly game, but the idea is just like, okay, I'm taking in literally physically what you're saying to me by catching this pillow, having it, sending it right back. And he just had this really, really basic thing of just listen, react and respond. Like that's it. It was very, very practically broken down in, I think, like chapter two of just what is acting at its core. And of course, it's so much deeper. There's so much to be done. There's so much work that you have to do and internal things that do, in fact, need preparation. Like it's, it's, it's the great craft. But at the end of the day, like at the very, very end of the day, just like right now, you're just listening, reacting, both nodding our heads and responding accordingly. And that's just human behavior. And so if you can replicate that on the screen, like this conversation right now is, is very real because it's not predetermined. We're just talking. So if a camera was catching us right now, this, would, this could be a masterpiece. <laughs> it's like, yeah. it's, you, re, you retry this on the screen with, with lines that are written and all of a sudden everyone's like uh, uh, stiff. And, and mm -hmm. so the book really taught me just listen, react, respond. That's it. And, and that really helped me, man. Like, that because because I, I was so in my head, as you know, I mean, X's and O's of football. It's like, all right, what am I going to do here? Read the safety. If he goes this way, we're going here. Read the defensive end. He crashes pool. It's like your mind is analytical. It's like, all right, we're going to do all these different things. So for acting, if this guy does this and here and where's the camera? It's like, no, just stop. Like, just listen, react and respond accordingly. And obviously come prepared with the tools that make your character unique to you. But once you've done that preparation, then you can be free to just to just authentically do this. And that helped me a lot in my auditions because everyone tries to force it. And if you just listen, react and respond, you won't really be forcing it. Another great example of less is more. Yes. And remains you know, really sound advice if you can yeah. if you can dig into it and, and go down the rabbit hole of it. And what does it really mean? Um, okay. and I've experienced that in my own life in a variety of ways, even this year, this isn't to well suggest that anybody should ever quit. That is not what I'm suggesting with this next question okay. or give up or, or, you know, have negative self-talk. I don't think that's helpful at all. Yeah. But you said in the past that your audition success is about 20 of 50. So for, so in other words, you have about a 40% hit rate, which I would say is very, very high at what failure rate at the audition level, in your opinion, should actors begin to question themselves or their talent or their process, man. So I will say two things that rate has since gone down a lot. And okay. I think that's intricate to this question because or I should say integral to the question, because the game has changed so unbelievably substantially. Um, so at that time, I really was batting and this, and if I'm going to track that quote back, we're talking about six years ago. And I really had, um, I was batting really high. I mean, I had just done 
American Horror Story, Grey's Anatomy, Criminal Minds, Notorious, like all within the span of a year or two. And I wasn't auditioning that much. And that rate that I was talking about includes callbacks. So I, I on when I said that, I, I do remember saying, okay, these, these are callbacks and bookings. And that's people are not getting that. That was really high at the time. But there's a couple things to keep in mind there. Number one, that was a time when we were auditioning in the room which means that, and I at the time was more or less just starting. So I was going on smaller parts. So I might've auditioned against a hundred people, um, you know, maybe 60 or something over the course of a few days, casting would call in, let's say 40 to hundred people. My odds then, believe it or not, are pretty good. Let's just say they're one in 100, but then mm -hmm. deal comes into play, preparation, everything else comes into play. So at the time I was batting like that. I would answer your question by saying that we are in a totally different digital era. There are no in-person auditions, sub commercials right now, and maybe a few producer callbacks and direct things. It's the age of self-tape. And right now, if, an, if a part five years ago would have had casting call in 30 people, I'm not a casting director, but I have played on the other side of the fence now and produced three films and casted them. I mean, if a part's going for 40 people, they might see 100 tapes now or more. Mm. So the statistics are now horrible. And again, you're in the, the, the same, the same point I would make with the digital age is also that the span is much larger. So instead of this core group of guys kind of in my demographic, like I used to run in the same circles and see a lot of the same guys at these auditions who are friends and rivals and, and in good ways, you know, um, I think competition fuels champions. That's something Bruce Smith told me actually a freaking could, that stuck with me forever. And I take that into acting where I'm like, all right, use those guys who were beating me and getting those parts who had been there longer. That doesn't exist anymore. Like you're just, you're just in your house or at a self tape studio with you and a reader. And it's, it's really drained a lot of it in the sense of the fun and the heart of it. So you send your self tape in and yeah, it can be way better, but that's actually not a good thing in my, in my personal opinion, because people who are less talented, can just tape a hundred times. And I've seen that happen. I've put people on yeah. tape who aren't good and their tape goes in and it looks much better than it actually is. And they show up on set and it's like, uh. So to answer your question, I if, if one is going to give up or quit or question themselves, I actually would not do it based on the merit of statistics right now because it's just mm -hmm. so hard and you're not getting feedback either. Back in the day, your agents, your manager could call casting and be like, hey, how did he do? What's going on? And yes, they still do that, especially if you're with a, a prominent agency, but casting is going to take longer if they respond at all, because if a hundred agents call them on a part that used to be 12 guys in the room, they're not going to give feedback to everybody. No way. So, right. um, they can't do it. They can't do it. Yeah. It's just a different time. So, um, I would say there is no statistic for me that's giving up, but if you're not hitting at all, I mean, if it's been years and if it's been multiple years and you don't have callbacks, um, don't quit. Just reevaluate what you're doing. Go back to the drawing board. Go take more classes. Surround yourself with the people who are better. Do do the steps necessary to get to the next step, if that makes sense. Don't just quit. But I would not dictate it off of statistics these days. Yeah, it's interesting because you know, I when I learned how to play piano, mm -hmm. uh, we would have recitals, mm -hmm. and I would find that I just psych myself out. So it's kind of like being in an audition. So I'd be terrible. So the song I could play at home when no one's watching, I would go play in front of people and just completely, sh you know, just like, yep. It, it, you know, you could, it wouldn't even, <laughs> it's kind of funny. These home videos exist somewhere, but the, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. it wouldn't even resemble the song that was supposed to be played. Like, that's how <laughs> nervous and how racked I would get. Yeah, and I found that uh, for me, I was one of these people who could do something really well if I was over prepared for it. Mm -hmm. So yeah. where I don't even have to think about anything where I've practiced so much that it's just same with singing, playing anything. And I just learned that, that about myself, whereas some people are, are kind of good to go, right? They've practiced it enough at home, but they're, they're good to go when it's ready. I need a little bit more. I need actually reps in the room totally, totally to to be good like i need reps with people watching me yeah yeah yeah. so um so I, that's what i'm trying to get at so i think m some people will get that muscle memory and will say okay i'm ready for stage i'll have that muscle memory but still need multiple reps with people watching me so i yes. so i can explore the env environment 
yep. a little bit I and, and see and face the fear, face the danger, whatever I think I'm afraid of. And I think if you're acting, sometimes that can happen too, where everyone knows you have talent, but maybe you're not getting the auditions. You're not getting the parts you get in that room and something happens. Yes. So in that case, maybe double down on your exposure. Yeah. 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 Big time. I agree. Maybe even have audition parties, bring, bring actor friends over and pretend like they're the casting directors. You know what I mean? A hundred percent. I would do that all the time. And again, it is a little different now because you're not in the room. So you don't, not in the room. for you, you just tape yourself doing those pianos, now, uh, p- playing the piano at home now. And you're like, Oh, I'm the, I'm the yeah. best ever. <laughs> no, yeah, 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 yeah. No one can beat me. Yeah. And then you show up. Yeah. The, so it's not a live setting anymore, which is weird. But I still suggest, like you said, yeah, absolutely, man. Do Zoom with your friends. Put the pressure on. When I used to have to go in the room, and if and when I have Zoom callbacks, I will absolutely do that. I'm a I'm a total weirdo with it. I absolutely over. <laughs> but the difference now is I don't over prepare. Going back to that first audition, I won't over prepare with a predisposed way of how I'm going to do something. I'll just over prepare. Mm-hmm. Like I have a tennis ball that I like to do. And for me, as you know, I love the box. So I'll have, once I get off book, which just means for anyone who doesn't know, uh, you, you have the lines memorized, right? Not how I'm going to mm-hmm. say them, just have them memorized. I'll have my buddies, I'll, I'll, I'll go in and hit the bag and have my buddies throw a tennis ball at me and catch it with every line. Boom, 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 catch it, boom, 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 catch wow. it, stay in line. Because then you're just, you, you can on a dime, catch it, boom, catch it, go, 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 drop down, push up. Like I'm a freak of weirdo about it. And then my body's just like, I'm warm, I'm ready to go. I've got these lines. And then I'll step into the audition room, which in this tape, these days is just a self tape now to where you're, you're just there. Your body's ready to anything to come at you and you're, you're going to react quickly to it. And for me, that's my version of like, I've, I've played in front of people. I have this, there are people saying the lines out loud to me and testing me with them, throwing them at me, saying different lines that are not necessarily in order to the script. There's all kinds of cool games and small things you can do, um, to kind of better prepare yourself. Like you were saying, it's like, I mean, it's like sports. It's like, if you're a boxer, you're trying to work on your left hook. Don't wear a glove on the right hand. Just go in and throw the left hook all day. Like they're, they're just like small things. Or if you got to, you know, if your leg is hurt in football, you're going to do something else to prepare, right? It's like, okay, maybe you're just throwing that day, whatever it is. You're not working on footwork. Acting is the same thing. It's a craft. Like you have to pick a specific thing and go work on it. Um, and I think people don't do that. It surprises me. I find a lot of ex athletes make really great actors. Yeah, I, it's a, there's something in the in the genes with that. And we interviewed Sam Brooks, who mm. uh, did Fear Street, and he, yeah. he talked about this this era of self taping. He said, "For me, I'm trying to create a character on the self tape, and I will look back at it, and I'll have people look back at it, and if it doesn't it move them emotionally, entertain them, I just know that I need to go tape again, and you're just doing it until until it actually." you know, moves them, you know, move someone or evoke some emotion. So I love what it. is your process when you do get the part and you've got a character, what is your process for character research? Once you've gotten the part? Yep. I would say it differs these days. Um, I do have a little breakdown. Like I have an actual sheet that I follow of just the, the bare necessities of what I want to do and, and the ways in which I'm going to kind of get into things. But uh, these days I've found it's more about trying to bring myself out in it. I used to try and find, for example, how I could portray this character. And now I try to find how the character can portray me in that kind of. Oh, that's interesting. It's very fun, man. It's very interesting. Yeah. And again, not, not coming from me. I'm not reinventing the wheel. These are just teachers who are, <laughs> who are, yeah, yeah, who are yeah. showing me and I, and me putting my own flair into it about how to bring your own self. And I know that sounds silly and this is going to sound, um, this is going to sound bad, but it's actually, it's actually a huge compliment. Um, people like Matthew McConaughey, we talked about him earlier. He's a perfect example mm-hmm. for the first bit of his career everything he did looked the same. <laughs> it was always Matthew McConaughey. <laughs> it's like fool's gold, yeah. how to lose a guy in 10 days. Like these are still the same yeah. dude, just being the same dude. He can't not have his voice and his charisma and his whatever. Um, and then, but then he goes off and does true detective. One of the, my opinion, yeah. great television performances of all time. Season one was um, best television ever made. Hands down. I agree. Yeah. Um, so long story short, I try to find ways that the character can portray me and get myself in there. What do I, you know, some people make a Spotify playlist and walk with their character. It's like, okay, well, 
yes, I'll do that, but let's blend those. Like, how can the character listen to my music? Because then I'm bringing myself to it. And ultimately, casting doesn't know what they want until they see it. They think, you know, most of them will, will say that themselves, I would say, actually, especially at a high level. And if you've got 100 guys who look exactly like you, or in my case, look exactly like me, they're all talented. They're all hungry. Because at a certain point, once you get, once you have a resume, you're going against real, real actors now, like legitimate actors, you know? And ultimately, for me, at that level, if everyone's portraying the same character, what sets you apart? Well, you could say your choices on the page, this, that, and the other, your preparation, but they're all good. They're all making interesting choices. Everybody is. And so at the end of the day, it's like, it's you. It's the only thing that can separate yeah. you because there's only one you. So you have to find out how to make Great your point. character look like yourself. So for me, I focus a lot more on that today than I used to. It reminds me of the quote you have, I believe you say, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit, if everyone's going 100 miles per hour, then <laughs> I need to go 200 miles per hour to compete. <laughs> but I, I was wondering, digging into that, what does that actually look like in reality? Like for uh, the actors listening again, what does one have to do to out-compete one of these talented actors that are to your left and to your right that you just mentioned? Yeah, man, that's a great question. That's one of my favorite quotes too. And I said that for me because at the time I was behind on the road. I mean, I started acting when I was 20 years old and, you know, most people who, not most, I should say, but a, a lot of the competition at that point already had resumes. So, and they were running hundred miles an hour and their hard yeah, work yeah. Were going. So that means how do I catch up? I got to run 200. Honestly, man, um, this is going to sound inherently like, I suppose, arrogant, but you just have to be a freak. You just have to be a freak. I mean, for a long time, and it's caught up with me now, to be totally honest and candid. I, I was I was doing the the whole I'll sleep four hours a night and just go 12 hours a day. I mean, I was mm -hmm. taking three different acting classes. And even throughout those acting classes, kind of like you just mentioned, mentioned about Sam Brooks, like I had my friends who we were putting each other on tape, sending it off, doing it again the next morning, like being a freak, going the extra mile, working harder than everybody else, finding things that are going to separate you. Like for me, a lot of the stuff that I've booked have been – kind of more athletic body-esque type of roles and so for me with the boxing and football keeping up those things those extracurriculars those talents for you if you're uh, really great at the piano don't stop that keep being great at the piano and then the next time they need someone for piano you're the guy so for me running 200 miles an hour is just going the extra mile above everybody always and that just requires sacrifice like i'm a weirdo man i'm a total weirdo uh, uh, you know what i'll show you right now uh, <laughs> yeah, please. I, for those listening me. to the audio only, Josh is walking me, uh, I think, to a room that will show his freak dedication to his craft. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. He's showing me a, a what appears to be an FBI crime scene room <laughs> with, <laughs> with whiteboards and lists and uh, <laughs> staying very organized. That's, I like that's that. it for me, man. Like if you're going to, if you're going to outwork everybody else, like you got to really do it. I have a yearly goals, which then translate into monthly goals, which then go to my planner, which is sitting right here for my daily goals organized. Like it's, it's, it has to become your nine to five, but it's not a nine to five. That's the problem yeah. with creative fields, particularly acting. It's like no one's getting you up in the morning. You have to find the will to do that. And it's like, how do you work for, let's say you want to work a 12 hour day. But you're not on set. How do you work a 12 hour day? What do you do? You're just going to act all day. <laughs> you know, yeah, you're just yeah, sitting yeah. in, in theater all day long. <laughs> it's like you have to figure out how to structure yourself, structure your life and get creative with it. So, um, it's tough, man. Uh, it's, it's really tough. The thing I love about life design and quarterly reviews, and I do both of them is that, and it sounds antithetical. Mm. The thing I love about it is that it pins the tail on the donkey. Uh, yeah. metaphorically speaking, yep. it, it forces the issue back on yourself is what I'm saying. It, it, it eliminates all your excuses. You put what you were supposed to do in your calendar. You had a plan, you wrote it down, mm -hmm. you said when you were going to do it. And if you don't do it now, you can't blame your wife. You can't blame your kids. Yep, you can't yep. blame your friends. You <laughs> can't blame anybody else. You didn't do it. It was right here and it didn't get done. And why? You didn't have the discipline to do it. You gave up on you. And, and when you don't have that life design, it's very easy 
it's a, it's a, it's an ideal way to live to not have a life design, uh, for those who don't want to <laughs> achieve stuff because, <laughs> because you can blame everybody, but you, 100%. no one's accountable and responsible or everyone's accountable and responsible except for you. Yeah. And when you have the life design, yeah. you end up having some really tough self-talk. Like you said, you wanted this. Do you really want this? Cause you're not doing the thing you said you're going to do. Well said. You're not, you know, you're not eating the way you said you're going to eat. You're not working out the way you said you're going to work out. You're not, oh. you had a plan to do, to learn these three things this year. Have you learned them? Yeah. You know, so it's, it's super powerful. And speaking of yeah. th this type of behavior, I recently finished uh, Will Smith's book, Will. Have you read this book? No, I thought you were going to say Extreme Ownership by Jocko Willing, which is another one. That Love, Jocko. <laughs> <laughs> Love Jocko. Love <laughs> Jocko. I have not. Great follow on Twitter as well. Dude. Uh, uh, for you need to be motivated. Just follow Jocko and Ooh. David Goggins. Yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Just tell you, you know. yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, man, that book is wow. Uh, I'm talking about ownership. But no, I have not read Will's, Will's book. Please, please continue. I, I presume it's the same, the same type of stuff. Well, it's his career. So it's, it's a lot more entertaining than extreme ownership, I'd say. Okay. But you have so many little jewels he drops in there just casually as an, as an actor. Yes. I would highly recommend the audio book because he narrates it. Same yeah. thing with McConaughey and Green Lights. Green Lights you could yeah, yeah. read Green Lights and you would enjoy it. You can read Will and enjoy it. But those, both those audio books are tremendous because you have the actors actually narrating the book. Yes. Yeah, yeah, right. But one thing he said in this book that jumped out to me was that he said that method acting on six degrees of separation, which was his first feature film was it contributed to his first divorce because he didn't want to fail at that so badly that he went into method acting wow, and became this character from that movie. Wow. And for those who don't know six degrees of separation, yeah. it was a highly, it, it was, it was a critical darling and it wasn't a box office darling. It's a critical darling. And Will Smith plays basically a con man who says he's uh, Sidney Poitier's son mm. and befriends a family. And then um, it's a good, it's a really good movie. Yeah. Uh, everybody should watch it. Yeah. Uh, but he said that when he got done with the movie, he couldn't jump back out of that character. Mm. And so he, his, he was lost and his wife lost him. And, you know, he'd actually fallen in love with his co-star on that set because the character was supposed to be in love with that yeah. person. And yeah. he would find himself waking up in the middle of calling this person and things like that. It was really fascinating to hear. And I'm just curious, have you had any experiences like that in any character you've had to go into? And have you delved into method at all? And, and you yeah. know, what is, you know, are you afraid of it for those reasons? No, it's a good question. I have um, more so through the audition process. The only film or show that I've ever done where I like truly considered myself method, and certainly not to that degree, because on a film like that, I don't, I don't know, but I'm going to presume they shot six to eight weeks or something um mm -hmm. when you have some serious time to dig in and change life um for me there was a there was an old film called there's no such thing as vampires i did it was actually the first movie i ever mm -hmm. did ever in los angeles and uh it was shot out in the joshua tree desert so i actually went to the joshua tree desert before that which by the way it takes us full circle to the other stuff later joshua tree but I actually went <laughs> before that and did just try to really feel what that was like out there learn what that lifestyle would be see what can't because the character camps out there a lot went out and camped but that was the extent of my methodism and then um i did for a couple of auditions uh there was this one audition man i'm trying to remember what it was i want to say it was like vampire diaries or something um something where it was like why is this in the script <laughs> but there was a yeah. character who was off of 48 hours of no sleep and i'd actually wow. done that test i actually basically just try to test myself to see how long i could go because you're going to have various things like that during hell week and stuff like that so i had tried that back in the day so i did it again and I recall being just uh, completely delirious auditioning and that part of the audition tape looked incredible, but I had to redo it. <laughs> I looked like crap. <laughs> nothing was, nothing was good. It wasn't going well. The lines were slurred. I, I was really <laughs> in it, but it was also like, man, if that was, if that was like the terminal list or something really gritty and real, then it, they were awesome, dude, you nailed it. But it was something like the vampire diaries or, or the 100 or something for the CW where they're like, this guy looks like yeah. crap. Like, they're not, yeah. this is crazy. <laughs> so, uh, it just didn't really play, but I, I do listen. I mean, nothing but respect if you can do that um it's not it's something that i may try again in the future if the situation calls for it but um i don't know man it's it's rare again going back to what i said about bringing yourself into it 
some some would say those would contradict each other. Um, and some of the greatest actors of all time have been method actors, and I am not holding a candle to their to their status yet. So I'm not going to sit here and question method. But there's definitely people who hate it. There's many directors, many filmmakers who think that it's people just kind of patting themselves on the back, trying to do a little too much that ends up impeding on the financial aspects of things or the literal day to day, 12 hours of your film set, or like you said, falling in love with another guy. There, there are lines to cross, um, which is not a scratch at Will Smith by any means, but you get my point. There's definitely some, some, some tough, yeah. like, ah, man, I don't know if that's quite worth it. If you can still put up the same level of work. So, so I don't know. It, it's, it's a fascinating thing to me that I, in truth, have never, never tried to that, that degree. Yeah, it is fascinating because for all its upside, you hear about nightmare stories like the set of Man on the Moon with Jim Carrey, where he couldn't <laughs> stop being Andy Kaufman and almost got himself killed Dude. because he couldn't stop being Andy Kaufman and people didn't know whether he was had had a break with reality. Very scary. You mentioned the Craig Wallace book, of course, but are there any other books you recommend? Yeah. For, to actors? Um, oh, man. Oh, for, for acting specifically? Or acting, producing, filmmaking, whatever, or, or just life in general. We'll take them all. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll go back to Extreme Ownership. I definitely recommend yeah. that book. That's an incredible book that will really change your life. Um, in terms of acting, there's a book that Michael Caine wrote. I think it's called Act on acting or something. Um, no, it might be called the actor's handbook. I'm not sure. I could, I could look that up pretty quickly, but, um, it's a Michael Caine book. It's fascinating. It's actually the only book that he ever, uh, wrote himself, Michael Caine. So, um, it's, or in terms on acting, it's really, really good. Um, there's a book called entertainment industry finances, I think. Um, and that was by a guy named, I believe Harold Vogler. That was one of the first producing books that I read where I was really fascinated by the financial aspect of the industry, how to raise money for feature films, how to understand gap financing, tax credits, all that kind of stuff. That is a really, really good book that I recommend because most people, they, most actors, I should say, it's like, nobody cares about your creative pitch deck. <laughs> like everybody has like a check out my vision for this film. Yeah. You and everybody yeah. else, like how are you going to actually execute and do this? So yeah. that book, uh, entertainment industry financing, I believe it's what it's called. I would highly recommend that. Uh, I think there's a great Uta Hagen book. Um, that's really, really fantastic. It's the only one she wrote. That's, that's big. There's, um, what else did I used to read back in the day? Those, it's been a while since I've read these. Though I would go with those. I would go U Uta Hagen, Michael Caine. If you're looking for producing, I would go with Entertainment Industry Economics is the name of it. Entertainment Industry Economics. Um, and then the Jocko Willink. Those would be my four books. There's a movement right now amongst film creatives to make Michael Caine the best actor of all time. Like just like there's a there's an argument to be made that Michael Caine does not get his due. I agree. And I think I think part of it is that it's so fun to do his voice. Yeah. <laughs> like imitate his voice that, that maybe, maybe that helps him and hurts him at the same time, you know, where he doesn't get put in line with Daniel Day Lewis or De Niro or, you know, but, but he's got a hell of a resume. So yeah, that, that, that that's a great list of uh, books and anyone who wants to hear some great Michael Caine impressions, go to YouTube and search for Michael Caine. She was only 15. <laughs> and, and, and a video will come up and I forget the two gentlemen's name. They're English gentlemen, but they're great. And I cannot believe I'm forgetting their names because they're legendary, but they basically go on a vacation, a road trip together. And they just basically compete on who does a better Michael Caine every time they have a meal together. <laughs> that and is hilarious. Oh, you and know it, what? it is way, so funny. Acting in film. That's the name of his book. Acting, Acting in, in film. film. By Michael Got Caine. It. And yes, that's hilarious. I'm going to write that note down. Uh, yeah, yeah. Write that down. It's, it's really, I, I'm like, man, how could I not, how could I not remember that? But uh, he's, yeah. he's, man, uh, that's hilarious. I have to go watch that video now. Yeah. As soon as we're done here, you go watch it and then text me and tell me what you thought. <laughs> <laughs> you you will. will not be disappointed. <laughs> I will. What, what's the best advice you've received in your career and, and who did it come from? Oh, um, oh man, I've got some good advice. Um, actually, the very first thing I ever did, I was a featured extra on, it was a, a pilot called Company Town for the CW, which I believe ended up being a, a, a TV movie. Um, but it's a legendary director named Taylor Hackford. 
Um, he was married to Helen Mirren at the time, this legendary actor. I believe he was the president of the DGA for a while. And he was directing this pilot and um, the lead, maybe, maybe it was the second position, but one of the lead male actors, um, his name was Graham. And he told me, uh, I, I don't want to incorrectly paraphrase him, but essentially just about the long game and enjoying the process. Like and he was like, listen, you know, cause I really did ask him, I was like, man, if you could give me any advice from a person in your shoes, what would it be? I believe he kept it easy and just said something like persistence, enjoy the process. And, uh, it's been a while since I mean, it's been eight years since that day. So, um, it's hard to remember exactly, but that was definitely, that stuck with me. I'm just like, enjoy the process, stay persistent. You're going to get your nose and keep going. Yeah. It reminds me a little bit of the Steve jobs, legendary Steve jobs, Stanford speech mm -hmm. where he talks about waking up enough mornings, looking in the mirror and not liking what you're doing. Yeah. yeah and, and listening to those, listening to, to those signals. That's not noise. That's signal saying you do not like your life right now. Like, yeah. like so enjoying the process is, is huge. I agree. You know, in the opposite vein, what are the biggest mistakes you see newcomers making? Because you're on the film production side, you're writing, you're acting. So you're seeing filmmakers and creatives of all sorts coming to the industry. Man, yeah, I would go back. There's so many. I would go back to the statement I just made, which is a specific statement, but kind of encompasses a lot of things that nobody cares about your creative pitch deck. Like that is quite literal. No one cares about your pitch deck for your movie, but also it's a bit bigger than that in the sense of like, you have to know more today it's not the same industry as it was. Like if you're trying to make a feature film and you've got your great deck and here's what I think this will look like, here's how I see this, here's my film comparatives, here's it's just, it's just the generic stuff, which I'm telling you, nine out of 10 filmmakers will have and they'll pitch it to you that way. Like, okay, you see it this way, but how are you gonna execute it this way? How are you gonna raise this money? What is the specific ask? Like, do you understand business? Do you understand finance? If you're coming to an investor or someone who's gonna potentially help you finance this feature, this is a business. This person expects a legitimate return on investment and he expects a timeline and, and, and a, a real, a very real business plan, which is tough. And I don't see any filmmakers who make those. So I think one of the biggest mistakes is taking meetings before you're ready. And I have done that for sure in the past. I've taken at least three meetings with people where I thought I was ready and I wasn't because there are levels to this on so many mm. fields. And, um, I mean, it'd be, it'd be like getting in the, you know, taking a fight before you're truly ready. And it's like, you just don't know what you don't know until you know it. So that's kind of a long winded way of saying the same thing about the pitch deck where it's like nine out of 10 actors I meet, they, they have a feature film. They may even have a script. It's probably horrible. Uh, and they, they have, <laughs> oh, so, <laughs> mine were horrible when I started too. Yeah. But not to say yeah. I'm a great right or not or Aaron's working by any means, but it takes time is what I'm getting yeah. at. And like, no one cares about the little things. You have to go to that next level. And then even there, once you start learning, like that book I told you earlier, once you start learning about the finance of things, you'll take a call with a seasoned producer thinking you're ready and thinking, you know, a thing or two, he starts talking a mile a minute. And it's like, you're hearing French people. It's, it's all of these economic terms that traditional actors are just, they have no idea what it's about. So if you want to produce and make a film. It's not this fairy tale land. Like people have this idea like, Oh, I'm going to go make this film. Yay. It's like, you're making a business product that if done correctly should sell somewhere, should have real distribution, both foreign and domestic. Like it's really tough. And so I think the, the advice is learn more. Don't take those meetings before you're ready. And no one cares about your happy, your happy land, your little pitch deck. Yeah, those are big mistakes. We get a lot of pitch decks here at Bonsai Creative um, where we're looking at it, especially when we were investing. We have three feature films in worldwide distribution. And Amazing. The, awesome, man. Um, yeah, thank you. And when we would look at them, there is a sense that you, that you get as an investor and as an EP that they think or that creative thinks, that believes that they have pulled one on you, that they have done something, uh, incredible, yeah. especially in the comp space. Oh. It's like, no, not with these comps are wrong. These 
there's no way you're comparing this to that. There's just <laughs> no way. Like you can't like, like yes. I, my yeah, $100,000 independent feature is going to do the same return as the Blair Witch Project or check this out. You know, we're yeah. going to be the Titanic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It just doesn't, it's just not a, it's not a thing, but I think that they, the, the interesting thing is, is that there is an honesty there. Like it's a, a naivete. Like it's like, no, this is what it's going to be. And there's that line you rob between being optimistic and delusional. Yes. And it's really hard to tell yes. where you're at if you're two feet in on your project. So I get it. So yeah. that's really incredible feedback. Your production company did a feature film. First one was Yucca Valley. You've got Man's Son mm -hmm. as well. What is your approach to P&A or in other words, marketing? Yeah. So, um, I would, and by the way, I have to clarify there, those actually ended up, um, that was a title change. So those became, so the second film is now Ride, well, the third film, technically, those became the same feature. Oh, got it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Yucca and, and uh, Manson. And so um, we, it was just a title change by the distributor. But um, yeah. the, man, for PA, you know, well, number one, if you're able to, same movie. Your, what's that? Um, same movie. Yeah, 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 yeah. Same movie. Movie. yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah, okay. I should have clarified that, that before, but we were talking about so much stuff. I was like, yeah, um, yeah, man. No if worries. you're able to to secure like uh, you know a presale, let's say from from a distributor beforehand, generally they're gonna. They're, it is now their vested interest for this film to do well because they've guaranteed you X amount of dollars on the minimum guarantee, and so for them, they're probably gonna take care of that. You know, um, and there's so, so many different ways to cut the cake. It's like if you're if you're gonna forego that and just go the festival route or try to make a sale when you're done, it's a, in my opinion, a more risky approach because if the product suffers in quality, then you don't have a an MG to at least make a little bit of money back. But um, you know, I actually haven't gone that route to have to deal with that myself from an advertising standpoint. Um, both of my feature films that the, the bigger ones, at least the Manson film and now ride have had pre distribution with a company called Wellgo USA and a company called XYZ films, both of which are just amazing, amazing people, um, and crushing the game, frankly, actually both companies. So for us, you know, it's, it, it was a partnership. It's, it's, it's within their interest now to go out and do this and publicize this themselves. So, um, I really haven't had to walk that bridge yet to be totally candid. Oh, it's, but that's great because I think what you talked about in the beginning is also one of those things. And I wouldn't call it a mistake per se, but it's just a bit of, um, either unwillingness or ignorance. Mm. It's another thing that I think we've run into is the structure of the film is so wonky yeah. that it makes it impossible for the film to do well, yes. regardless of how good the movie actually is. Yes, 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 yes. We interviewed cool. a guy named Nicholas Frangioni who made okay. Nomadland before Nomadland, in my opinion. Wow. But nobody knew it existed <sighs> because he didn't, you know, he, the structure was wrong. And so I always say, you know, have that financial structure, right? You, you want to get a third from the taxpayer. You want to get a third, uh, from equity and you want to get a third from a bank and you want to do a pre-sale yeah, if you I, can to your point. So I think that still, even though you haven't had to walk that bridge, I think it's such an important point about the structure of your film. If you plan on being successful. Very much agree. Very much agree. Yeah. There's so, like we said, there's so many different ways to cut the cake, but you know, you talked about Andy from Virginia and the Virginia film commission, like that's that that's the bread and butter. And that's why film is shifting everywhere now. I mean, I'm, I'm in Nashville right now and we're, we're, we're getting closer and closer with the commission here and we're, we're slated right now to make two more films this year here. And so you've got, I'm also in Nashville, by the way, hey, there yeah, we go. beautiful Nashville, Tennessee. Yeah, I, well, outside of that, I'm in, I'm in the Brentwood area. Um, hey. Are in Brentwood, but no one knows what that is. So I always say Nashville. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. I've got some good friends in Brentwood. That's funny. Wow. All right. Well, yeah, coffee. yeah. We'll have, we'll have to get together. Coffee coming. It coffee coming. Got, me and you. It just got way easier. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We could have. We could have done this in person. <laughs> oh man, you're right. Very <laughs> we'll do. We'll do. We'll do round two. We'll do round two in person. Um, I just wasn't sure if you were going to be in LA or, or here or where. I've been back so. and forth a lot. No, I know. I appreciate it yeah, yeah. very much, man. Um, definitely been back and forth a lot, which I suspect will be the, the 
trend for quite a while. But um, but yeah, no, in short, you're right. You got to use these tax credits. You have to utilize them. I mean, West Virginia is now giving out like 33%, something crazy. Obviously, Oklahoma, we were, we were going to shoot wow. ride in Oklahoma, but Martin Scorsese went with Killers of the Flower Moon and literally sucked up the entire, <laughs> the entirety. The entire budget. <laughs> it was dang close. It was, I'm not sure it was all of it, but exactly. It was pretty close, man. And, yeah. and then it was extremely competitive between a couple other films. And ultimately, we had to pivot last minute and come here in Tennessee. And uh, those are wide open, still a great rebate here. And uh, to your point before, as long as you have somebody to gap that in a bank, like you were saying, finance until they actually give you that money, you're, you're running I and mean, you're running clear, man. You get a little bit of equity and uh, you just got to set it up correctly. It's, it's really a step-by-step thing, like you said. And, you know, I'm learning. We're all learning. Everyone's always learning. If you think you know it all, you're probably stuck. <laughs> so, uh, so true. But you're right, man. The tax, the tax credit is changing the game right now. Yeah, so, so true. And shout out to Bob Rains and Hazella Moore, <laughs> who run the Tennessee film office. Um, and uh, I, this is kind of fun. And you know, feel free to name more than one if you want to, but I'm only asking for one. Okay. If you would, could be introduced to one person in film, uh, who would it be and, and what makes them special? Oh, man. So I know it's hard because you probably oh, have 50. I, but I do. Like, I, like but anybody, but. Man, that's a tough one. In film only? Yeah. Mm, I've got a lot. I, 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 I'll give two. I'm going to give two. Okay. <laughs> no, I know. I have too many. I'm going to give two. I will go with Keanu Reeves. Mm-hmm. I have heard he is the nicest human being who's ever walked the face of the earth. Um, I mean, the, the things that I have heard about him from people who have actually met him and interacted with him – lead me to believe he's he's probably an extraordinary human being who's been through some stuff and i would love to learn and gain some wisdom from him so i'd go with him and then i'd go with a newer guy who's named jack carr who made the terminal list which i hmm. talked about earlier yeah a lot of people don't know about him yet. i love the terminal list that was great dude oh man i know and i almost said chris and, and i can't yeah. believe chris pratt pulled it off I, I i kept i was watching it with my wife and i said yeah. I don't think I said this is an interesting casting because when I see Chris Pratt's face, yeah, and I mean this respectfully, of course. I want to laugh. He's funny. He's a funny. He's dude. naturally funny, <laughs> but he's got to be this, you know, this badass guy. Yeah, man. He pulled it off brilliantly, Josh. I big fan of the Terminal List on Amazon. Everybody yeah. should go watch it. Everybody should go watch it. And I mean, they just got greenlit for a second season. They're doing another spinoff show off of it. They may even be doing a second one. I've read his books. And so that, so to, to give some light to him, he was a former SEAL himself who's now, he wrote a series of books. The, the literature is incredible. Definitely go read those as well. And then obviously, I don't know the exact story of how it came about, but I guess he's got a couple other buddies who are, were either active duty or ex-guys who knew Chris. One thing led to another and the series became reality. But um, man, you know, in terms of that platform we were talking about earlier and just promoting good into the world and, and really trying to make something a little bit different, he's definitely cutting edge on that. So I'd love to chat with him and see how see what and how he's doing um, really all the things that he's doing. So th- those would be my two people because Keanu is just like a light to this world. <laughs> who I would just love to mentor under. And then Jack is a guy who I'm like, oh, this guy's carving a path that's very similar to what I would like to do. So two very easy answers for me. Can we spell Jack's last name? Yeah, uh, Carr, C-A-R-R. Okay, got it. Jack. So everybody can look that up. Jack Carr, yeah. buy the books, watch the series, They're support wild. per yes. usual. Yep. 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 All right, so I'm coming to you on my knees. I'm an actor. I'm a new actor. I'm coming yeah. to Josh, and I'm saying, Josh, I've never acted before, but somehow I have a role coming up. I, I don't know how I got the role. I, I got lucky in the audition room. I don't know what I'm doing. I've never acted before. What are the first three things you teach me to make me a competent actor? Number one, taking it back, listen, react, respond. Mm-hmm. Number two, strong, strong moment before what's happening right before the camera starts, be in a position to when it rolls, probably be mid scene. And if you're mm. entering a scene, where have you just come from? What happened the last 24 hours? What phone calls did you just take? What is your mood? Why is your mood that strong moment before huge? That would be the, the if you're a new actor and you're not really sure where the scene's going to go, that's okay. You shouldn't be. What you can be sure of is where the scene came before 
Where were you? Mm. What happened? If you're mid conversation, what was spoken? How is this starting? You're not the writer, but you can dissect the text and say, okay, I know that this scene started mid argument. What is this person's want and what is my want? Why does she want it? And why do I want this and within the, 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 you know, the parameters of the scene? So once you can identify those things, you can go back in time and say, okay, so what have we likely said before? If this is a, if these are two, if this is an alcoholic and his, his mother and the mother is saying, you've got to go back to AA and he's saying, I'm not going to, well, why, what did he do beforehand that made her say, well, you, you need to go back. And for you, your position is like, well, why should you be allowed to drink and not go back to AA? Cause it's ridiculous for you, even though in reality, it's likely not moment before that you can do so much with that. And then the third and final thing is just the want. Taking it right back there. What do you want out of the scene? What do you want from this person? If you can listen, react, and respond authentically, knowing what you want from this individual and knowing where you just came from, you can crush 99% of the scenes out there. That's great advice. Um, wonderful. I think I would I would nail the part. <laughs> 30 days taking your advice, I'd, I'd, I'd do great. Um, <laughs> imagine that uh, you had to build a, a starter kit mm. for actors. Maybe you were selling this kit online. Maybe they bought it from a store or whatever. Yeah. Can you just say what would be in the starter kit? Like just, it can be anything from uh, a type of a coffee tumbler to <laughs> clothes, to books, to yeah, movies, yeah. to watch anything. What would be in that starter kit? If we signed up to, to Josh Plassey Academy, you can but, name brands if you want to as well. Yeah. Great question. I'd go with the acting books. Mm -hmm. I'd go with a fresh wardrobe of unique things. Get mm. a cop outfit. Get a suit. Okay. Get something, get scrubs for the ER. Get a pin for it with a, a school name on it if you're auditioning for a teacher. Uh, very specific wardrobe would be my second thing. Get lights for your self-tape. Get a box of fake cigarettes that you can smoke. Fake cigarettes on oh, that's camera. Great. Have yep. a nice flask next to you to be drinking from, right? Things like this. Have the things that are right next to you that are in your toolbox there that you can use. No, casting doesn't want to see you hold a real gun or a real knife necessarily. It's just a bit, it's certainly not in the room. Don't ever do that. But on even on camera it's, and on tape, don't do that. I'd go with those items. I'd have... Um, you know, for me downstairs, I have like a smorgasbord of things in front of me that I can just pick up and use at any given time where you have some fake gum, you have things that you can use, um, you know, uh, have, have a deck of cards, poker chips or something that is just something you're doing. And it might be off camera, like right here with my hands, but now all of a sudden I'm doing something that's important. Have a, a notepad that you can write notes on as a detective, things like that, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that would be in my actor starter kit. This one, admittedly I haven't used in a while but i probably will get a tear stick from leslie khan studios <laughs> tear stick okay, okay. good tool uh, i'm to, gonna write that down when, taking that note tear stick dude when, <laughs> when you're on set at 2 a.m you've been out for 13 hours it's been a long month and you just can't get the tears the tear stick will get you there. <laughs> uh you can take that one to the bank <laughs> that would be my kid i love it that is, that's fantastic advice. I love, I love all those things. I, I started to think about uh, Ocean's Eleven, not the original, but the one with George Clooney and, yeah. and uh, Brad Pitt and how the fact that they always had Brad Pitt eating something in every scene. Yes. yes. And it gave him something to do with his hands Everything. and it made his character sticky and, and likable and, and a little deeper than it would have been otherwise. It's like this guy's always eating nonstop. Yeah, like he's yeah. shoving things in his mouth in every scene while he's walking and talking. It's real. I do it in every audition. Like if you have that moment before, if you come in somewhere, you're already crunching it and you're just rock and rolling or you're already drinking and you're in the that's just real. Like you're just not actors are so yeah. stiff. Like, oh, and here's my line. And there's their lines. No, just chill. There's yeah. my drink right now. Drank it. <laughs> it's, it's normal. Yeah, be doing something. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> that's that's fantastic, man. And uh, not to not to bring us down at all, but you know one of the realities of this business is that you do get told no a lot, yeah. no matter what your role is, director, actor, crew, you name it. You have to have thick skin to proceed on, but that doesn't mean that you're sort of oblivious to and and protected against some of the mental health. Uh, 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 trauma and, and, um, and, and 
sort of mental health uh, obstacles that that come with this business. So yeah. I am curious if you've ever been in a dark place and, and if so, how did you get yeah. through it? Yeah, man, that's a great, great, great question. I have been in dark places for sure. We all have. Anyone who tells you they haven't is likely lying. Um, I remember specifically one night, um, in Santa Monica, actually, I used to run a lot late at night and try to clear my head and again, go back to that extra mile, just get a little bit more work in, which at the time was working, not smarter, was working harder and detrimental to my health. And I was thinking I was moving past people and I wasn't because what are you really gaining by becoming a better runner and better shape as an actor? Not much. So, uh, man, I was running one night. Um, and it wasn't that late yet. And I got a call from my agent that I did not get a part that I was up for and I had tested for, and I had been through mm -hmm. probably three network tests at the time and none of them had gone my way yet. And this one was the same and I really wanted it and I bled for it and died for it. And that happened right at the same time that I'd got some bad family news. And I remember being in an alleyway in Santa Monica on 11th street in Arizona. I'll never forget it. And I'm sitting there and I just started crying and I was just like, man, and the next day, I, I had two acting classes. I had work. I was working at a restaurant at the time. I was teaching boxing on the side. You're just, you know, your planner is just smacked and you have all these things. And you, I thought this was going to be the one to finally set me free or whatever. And um, I remember not getting it, simultaneously having that news, being exhausted and just breaking down and just like crying literally in that alleyway and just really wondering and questioning what was going on. And for me, uh, the short answer is I'm a religious guy, man. Like I, I need Jesus in my life personally. And so I, at the time was pretty lost and I was just like, man, like, I don't know what my purpose is and purpose is so huge in this industry. It's not going to be religious for everybody by any means. It's going right. to be whatever your purpose is, what sets you ablaze and gets you up to go in the morning. Cause like, like you said, man, when push comes to shove, time's going to go by and you're going to face hard, hard adversity in this industry. Cause even when you get to the top, that's just going to bring another slew of problems. And if you don't, you're going to consider yourself not lucky for getting there. There's really the, the really hard thing about the entertainment industry is that there's always the next step. You get your, your co-star, you need the guest star, you get the guest star, you need the recurring, you get the recurring, you need the series regular, you get the series regular, you need the bigger agent, you get the CAA. Now you need to be a movie star, be a movie star. Now you need to be a legend. It, is ne it never will end because that's the human spirit and we're never satisfied. And so it's like, this industry can just really give you comparative mind and, and put you in dark places at every step of the way. So if you don't have your purpose and your why to what you're really doing this for every day, like what is your goal? What are you saying? What are you trying to do for this world and for yourself to better it? I think you're going to have a hard time, even if you get there. So I remember yeah. being in that spot and uh, just really questioning my why. And I ended up going to the beach I think maybe two days later and just spending seven hours by myself, just walking around, talking to God. And I got a call after those seven hours that I had just booked Grey's Anatomy. So I didn't get wow. the other one, but I got that one and it was incredible. And it just reaffirmed my, my answer in, in saying, you know, what am I doing here? God, like, what's, is this what I'm supposed to be doing with my life? I'm struggling. I'm crying. I'm hurting. There's all kinds of stuff going on. Could I, should I have just gone seals? Should I have done something else? Not that that's an easy thing, but you get my point. Um, and I remember in that moment, just being reaffirmed and what I'm trying to do right now. So for me, that was mine. It was purpose checking back in. Like you said about your quarterly report for some people, that's going to be what it is and just putting your pedal to the metal, you know? Thank you so much for that, man. Of course. That's a great, great story. That That's huge. And I think it'll be meaningful for everybody listening. Yeah, I am curious, have you ever done an ayahuasca retreat and, or would you do one? And if you I, have done one, would you recommend it for people? <laughs> I have actually not done one. No, I haven't done one uh, at all. I'm actually not even super familiar. Please fill me in. So ayahuasca now is being used in PTSD for yeah. soldiers. Yeah. And it's, it's, uh, it's a tea, mm -hmm. an ayahuasca tea, and you drink it and um, you will have an experience in about an hour after drinking it uh, <laughs> that will, that will take you basically inside your own brain wow. and, and outside of your own body and, and address, you know, what's ailing you. Wow. And it just occurred to me that you would be a great person to go on an ayahuasca retreat with. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I never say no kind of a guy, man. I'm so I actually haven't heard of that at all. And I'm pretty familiar with a lot of these 501Cs that are I'm doing work in that space. So I'm, I'm surprised. So it's a, it's a T I will, I will look this up. 
whatever. Ayahuasca tea. It has, it's, it's a, it's a, you know, it's, it's, it's in the family of, you know, yeah. mushrooms, magic mushrooms, things like that. Yeah, yeah. You do it with a shaman. Interesting. Uh, you have a gut, you have a guide. It's not about uh, drug use. This is not a drug that it's not recreational. You do it for your soul. You do it for the spirit. Okay. It's usually a retreat. You usually do it in, you have, you have to travel to do it. Uh, South America, Central America, yeah. there'll be shamans there, people who are experienced with it. It's a plant. Wow. So it's a tea, but it's been around for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Wow. And it has just to give you an example. Um, I mean, it's been, it's, it was one of the, uh, reasons Steve Jobs said he was able to invent the iPod. <laughs> uh, uh, wow. Uh, That's uh, crazy. Wow. Interesting. I think he was doing something like that with Billy Corgan from the Smashing Pumpkins. <laughs> <laughs> like a wow. random, two, oh, that's a, that's a, a random mashup right there but, there, yes. but people when you google it you'll see a bunch of stuff because there'll be a lot of testimonials yeah but you know, the dark side of it is is that if you have a lot of demons yeah. you can have a really terrifying experience as well wow where where wow. you because you have to confront those things yeah. the t forces you to to confront those things from your wow. childhood or your whatever it is so uh, it'll, it'll be fun to do and uh this is this has been incredibly fun to do as well josh yeah, yeah. um i, I just I, I can't believe uh how much knowledge you've been able to drop on us um Thank you're you. always moving forward uh you're always uh competitive and, and on the cutting edge what's what's next for josh classic Thank you very much, man. Um, a lot. I, uh, I'll try to be concise here. I, I have the Baxters releasing soon. Um, I've got about five episodes releasing of a Tyler Perry show called all the Queens men, which you can catch. Um, that was an incredible experience by the way, someone else we should have talked about. Wow. Tyler Perry is absolutely <laughs> the game. Um, yeah, the man needless to say, um, so you can catch both of those things. Um, and then ride is going to release later this year. And man, I'm so unbelievably proud of that film. We shot it here in Tennessee. It's, it's definitely the best piece of art I've ever created by far. Um, and I think that will remain true for a bit. And then next we've got, uh, two feature films coming up down the pipe this year, one called the pirate King, which I won't give away the, uh, gist on, but it's going to be awesome. <laughs> and, uh, it's, oh man, I'm very excited. And then for me personally, I have just put the final touches on a very long, uh, medieval fantasy novel that I've been writing for like seven years. So wow. it's part of my board of craziness up there. And, um, I, I think it's quite good. I, I could be wrong. I could be fooling myself here, but I think it's quite good. So, um, I'm actually getting ready and gearing up to move out and take the next steps with that. So those are all exciting things. Obviously ever auditioning. I've got a couple coming up this week that I'm excited for, and I'll say stand by and we'll see where it all goes. Yeah, absolutely. Are you going to submit ride to the Nashville film festival? Dude, that's so funny. You say that we just talked about this a little bit ago. If we don't, we will do a national premiere. Um, okay. If we do, obviously the film will play there. We know a couple guys who are actually on that board for that uh, festival. I'm on the board. So you are too. Okay. So then yeah. we'll be about this. I was going to say, yeah, we very much might. Uh, so that's funny. That's going to that's gonna come back to us here shortly, perhaps after this. But but yeah, we very, mu very much might. Uh, the only, so I'll, I'll be totally honest with you, the only thing holding us back right now is the distributor wants to release the film a bit later. And this, they generally like to release it on the back of a festival. So they're trying to figure out the structure and how to do this with the timing of things. So if we do go to the National film festival which is kind of a no-brainer for us having shot it here and the, the subject matter lends it towards that festival um then all of a sudden if the film's not quite ready or the distributor wants to go three months later that we'll just kind of have to see how it all works you know um but i i would say there's a very high chance yeah lovely and let me know if you want to do some test screenings and uh, yeah. with a bunch of uh peers Absolutely. and maybe we can mix in some some non-peers as well and see see how it all pans out but that would be totally, totally awesome uh, can you tell everybody where they can find you on social media and on the internet? For sure. For sure. Yeah. Instagram is the best one for sure. I I'm on Facebook. I don't use that anymore, but please find me on Instagram. My handle is just my name. It's just at Josh Plassey. Um, you'll be able to find me pretty easily. Um, I don't use social media enough, but I should. So, uh, definitely find me on Instagram. Um, I have a business email. If people are trying to hit me up for business, which is Josh at pinebaypictures.com. It's really easy to find. Um, and yeah, man, I'd say those are the two easiest ways. 
All right. And we'll end on this. You are a whiskey and bourbon connoisseur. <laughs> if you had to make a selection for me, for my, for my shelf, what are you pulling out? If money, if, if, if money's not a uh, object and you can't pick Pappy, what do you, what do you get? What do you get me? Oh man, I'd go with Blanton's right now. Ooh. I've been really hot on Blanton's. They are incredible. It's really cool. And it's fun because every bottle has a horse on the top with a letter mm -hmm. that spells Blanton's. And if you can collect Blanton's, they give you like a lifetime supply of Blanton's whiskey. It's insane. There, it's, <laughs> yeah, the, the rule has since changed, so I'm not sure what it is today, but I know it's, it's pretty impressive. And that whiskey is incredible. It's, it's top shelf good whiskey. Yeah. It, so that's, so you just taught me something. So I am a guy with two bottles of Blanton's in his house right now. Yeah. And I did not know about the spelling of the name to get the, yep. what I would just like to spell the name. So if they give me a lifetime supply, great. If they don't, great. But I just like to say, Hey, I collected them and I, I spelled the name. Boom. It's I did it. Insanely hard. Um, Look at, so you see the horse on it right there. Then there's a horse with yeah, a letter yeah. on the top of it. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. You just I have do. to spell it out. And I guarantee you, they like, don't do a certain letter for years just so, just so they can't oh, got it. no one's yeah. gonna win yeah i don't know that for sure but that's what i would do um but blanton's is good man that's good stuff yeah i hope they don't game it like well i guess they kind of have to because that's a right. big prize right but right, right. you know i i just read a story about like the lotto people lottery oh, where yeah. they basically are able to see what numbers people are picking most often and they just pick around those numbers <laughs> so that so that your chances of winning someone will win but the chances right. drop dramatically so i just hate the idea of it of, of them gaming it too much I know. but uh, I know. you're spot on on the on, on the blend so blends is great and to your point, it's a fun bottle. Yes, you have the horse at the top and that metal top, which is really cool. Yes. But it's also circular and short. It's like a stubby bottle. Very. Uh, they've got the batch written on there and sort of in script. Right. And when you set that down at a dinner party or cocktail party, you're going to win. You're going to win. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're winning for sure, man. For sure. Shout out to yeah. Blanton. Yeah. <laughs> shout out to Blanton and, and shout out to you. Uh, this has been an amazing time. Uh, thanks to Abigail for, for helping out with this as well. Uh, shout out to your publicist, Abigail. And uh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, to, together soon, absolutely. coffee, cocktails, lunch, whatever. And um, yeah. we'll see what's in store for us. Because I, I, I love when the universe puts incredible people in my life. So, so thanks again, man. Amen, dude. Thank you, Chris. The same to you across the board. We will, we will see one another very soon. Talk to you, man. Be good. Be good. Peace.